privilege to have them attending North, and uh, Steve is going to speak to us today from God's Word. He's a graduate of Northwestern College before it morphed into a university. He's also a graduate of Bethel Seminary, majoring in Christian education and youth ministry. He's been a pastor for 35 years in various covenant churches around the area and retired last year from Brigham Covenant Church. We're pleased to have him. Steve? Come. Thanks, Gary. Good morning, church. Good morning. My wife and I and our kids and our, their families have been uh, attending North for just about a year. And um, we really appreciate this church. We appreciate its leadership the preaching, the teaching, the, the sense of uh, family that there is here, and um, the music ministry is wonderful. And speaking on behalf of my two grandsons and for myself, we greatly appreciate whoever it is who puts out the cookies in the foyer before the service starts. By the way, the chocolate chip and the peanut butter cookies are the best, whoever it is. <laughs> so. The Bible is full of imagery that helps us understand the Christian life. We are part of the army of God engaged in battle. We are part of the body of Christ, each of us an important member of that body. We are Christ's ambassadors representing him in his world. We are branches connected to Christ who is the vine. We are the bride of Christ in a loving, committed relationship. And all of these metaphors are rich and useful in our understanding the Christian life, but my favorite analogy compares the Christian life to running in a race. So I'd like to invite you this morning to lace up your running shoes and join me for a little Sunday morning jog. And I'd like to just pray briefly before I get started. Lord, I am weak, but you are strong. Lord, you know all things. I still have a lot to learn. But one thing I know and I trust is that, God, you know what we need to hear today. And I trust that, God, that you have given me the words that you um, want us to hear today. And I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would empower me and use me as an instrument in your hand. And I pray, God, that, that these words might encourage, challenge, and draw us closer to you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The year was 1995. I was serving as a pastor at Lund Mission Covenant Church, and I was 33 years old, had a 38-inch waist, weighed 210 pounds, and every time I looked in the mirror, I said, man, Steve, you look like you're eight months pregnant. And then one day, for some unknown reason, a crazy consideration, an insane idea crossed my morbid mind. I'm going to run Grandma's Marathon. Now, there was a day when I was a decent runner. I could run a five-minute mile without training. I had run several 10K races. I loved running and always thought it would be cool to run a marathon. But I hadn't run in eight years, and I was significantly heavier. Well, I registered, was accepted. Thus, I officially began in April with three months to prepare for the test. My first run was one mile. I thought I was going to die. <laughs> How am I ever going to finish 26 of these in a race? Well, I trained as much as I could. I dropped from 210 to 190 pounds. I was running approximately 12-minute miles and trained up to a distance of 15 miles. And if you're doing the math, that's 11 miles short of what you need to do to finish a marathon. So as you can imagine, I really wondered if I had it in me to cross the finish line. In fact, I had one of my in-laws inform me that she didn't think I could do it. Well, if I needed any further incentive, there it was. And finally, the weekend of the race came. I went back, to, went to pick up my race packet and check out the runner's expo. And I remember checking out the other runners. Everybody looked thinner than me. Everyone looked in better shape than me. I felt like I was more suited for competing in a pie-eating contest than in running a race. And, and that night before the race, I, I was literally pacing my parents' 
house, nervous, wondering if I should even, could even be doing this, or wondering if I should be doing this, and, and the weather forecast called for extreme heat conditions. I'd only trained up the 15 miles. I really started to share the doubts of my encouraging in-law, and needless to say, I got about a couple hours of sleep that night by the time my alarm went off at four in the morning. And near the starting line, I did my stretches. I said a number of prayers. I determined that my goal would simply be to finish. I wasn't going to run too hard. I was just going to try and enjoy myself. And with over 8,000 runners standing behind the starting line on that two-lane North Shore Drive near two harbors, the horn blasted, the race commenced. It took me nearly four minutes to get to, get to the starting line because there were so many people. <laughs> and I remember hearing one spectator shout out as I was crossing the starting line, see ya, wouldn't want to be ya. Thanks for the encouragement, buddy. And you know, the first half of the race didn't go so bad. I wasn't running fast. I was feeling pretty strong. I was singing praise songs, not out loud, mind you, and quoting scriptures and praying my way along. And every mile marker reached produced a thank you, Lord. And, And I'm thinking, you know, this isn't so bad. Now, there are two critical moments during a marathon. The first is the beginning. Your adrenaline is pumping and you feel so good, you you start out too fast and you use up your energy too quickly. And the second critical moment is the halfway mark, because you still have as far to go as you've already run. And by the way, when I was crossing the halfway point, the race's winner had already crossed the finish line several minutes before. Well, it was at this point that things started to take a downward spiral. My feet started to swell. My shoes got tight, causing spasms in my toes and blisters. I lost three toenails that day. And as the sun rose higher in the sky, it got much hotter. It was over 80 degrees with a high humidity, and I got sunburned all over my body. And my chest began to bleed because my shirt was rubbing raw. And the chafing on the inside of my thighs and armpits was painful. The muscles in my low back and legs began to gnarl and bind up. My pace dropped considerably. My prayers had disintegrated into, what have I gotten myself into, Lord? And I wasn't singing anymore. The distance between mile markers seemed to have quadrupled. And and I was being passed by men and women twice my age. And by the time I got the lemon drop hill at mile 22, I had to stop and walk my way up. My body was crying out, stop already, and my heart was yelling, don't you even think about it. And at the top of the hill, I started running once again. And when I got to Superior Street, I was completely spent. I was not running, I was plodding along on fumes. And when I reached mile 26, only two-tenths from the finish line, I could see the finish line. Both sides of the streets were packed with people cheering and yelling, and I felt a surge of energy, and I don't know where it came from, but it empowered me, and my pace quickened, and finally, four hours and 48 minutes after I started Grandma's Marathon, I crossed the finish line. And my first thoughts were, that was a lot of fun. (laughs) Yeah, right. No, my thoughts were, I did it. I finished the race. Throughout the New Testament, the Apostle Paul and the writer of Hebrews compare the life of faith to running in a race. And this is no easy race, mind you. This, this, it's, it's not a sprint. It's not a middle distance run. It's not even a leisurely morning jog. It's a marathon. No, it's a, it's a mega marathon. And furthermore, if you've trusted in Christ as your Lord and Savior, in case you didn't know, you're already a marathoner whether you realized it or not. So I'd like you to turn to somebody, turn to somebody next to you, and I want you to say these words. You're one fine athletic specimen. Would you turn to somebody and say that to them right now? Uh, Okay, that's enough, that's enough. Now concerning marathon running, I would often hear people say, you gotta be crazy to to wanna run that distance, or, or I could never do that. And you know something? People say the same thing about following Jesus. But let me tell you, the experience of running a marathon is awesome. Yes, it can be grueling. It requires discipline and commitment. And when you cross that finish line, words just can't describe the sense of accomplishment, the feelings of elation. And with these thoughts in mind, I'd like us to turn to Hebrews chapter 12, where the author writes, Therefore, since we are surrounded by a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, 
Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, and especially the sin that so easily hinders our progress, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes focused on Jesus, on whom our faith depends from start to finish. He did not give up because of the cross. On the contrary, because of the joy that was waiting for him, he thought nothing of the disgrace of dying on the cross, and he is now seated at the right hand of God's throne. Think of what he went through, how he put up with so much hatred from sinners. So do not let yourselves become discouraged or give up. And based on this text, I would like to share with you three practical strategies that will help you to run more effectively in this marathon we call faith. The first is to run freely. When running in a marathon, you dress as lightly as possible. That's why you don't see people running in coveralls and and work boots. Rather, the runner wears lightweight, moisture-wicking shorts, a singlet, socks, and shoes. Furthermore, the lighter the runner, the swifter the runner. Every ounce counts in a uh, foot race. And as I said earlier, I weighed 190 pounds when I ran my first marathon, which was 1995, Grandma's Marathon, and my best finish was three hours and 46 minutes, over an hour faster at the 2002 Twin Cities Marathon. So how much did I weigh then? 150 pounds. So carrying 40 less pounds resulted in a swifter, more successful race. Think about it this way. Imagine me having this strapped to my back, running 26 miles. 40 pounds here. You take it off you run a lot better. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down. How frequently are we overloaded and overwhelmed by the accumulation of our ambitions and activities? Our time-consuming careers are insanely overbooked schedules. Please don't get me wrong, I'm not trying in any way to imply that our ambitions and our activities, our calendars and careers are wrong in and of themselves. But what I am saying is when they become excessive, though they may look good, though they may be good, they can often keep us from what's most important in life, which is our relationships. Our relationships with family and friends, but primarily our relationship with God. We get so busy, so preoccupied that we have no time for them or him. And in our text, the author specifically instructs us to strip off, to get rid of any sin that is in our lives. He says, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily hinders our progress. The Apostle Paul reminds us in Romans 3.23 that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And please note that he informs us that we all sin. And we all sin a lot if we're honest about it. None of us exempt. And also note that the author of Hebrews reminds us that sin hinders our progress. Indeed, sin is a very serious matter. We just have to look to the cross to know that. But sin will take you farther than you ever thought you'd stray. Sin will leave you so lost, you'll think you'll never find your way. Sin will keep you longer than you ever thought you'd stay. And sin will cost you more than you ever thought you'd pay. You see, sin often begins as a thought, which then becomes an action, which then becomes a habit, which then becomes our character, which then becomes a destiny. Think about it, a little fib can lead to living a lie. A lustful look can lead to adultery. A sip, snort, or syringe can lead to an addiction. A frustration can lead to resentment and rage, and a sinful secret can lead to shame and self-hate. You see what I'm saying? Sin will weigh you down, it will trip you up, and ultimately it will cause you to falter and fall. Listen to King David's words in Psalm 32 as he describes the effect of hidden sin, in particular in this writing, his adulterous relationship with Bathsheba. He writes, When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. And this is precisely why I encourage people to keep a short account with God. 
Don't allow sin to accumulate. Don't don't allow it the opportunity to morph into a habit, an addiction, or a lifestyle. Rather than letting sin become an impediment or hindrance in your race of faith, repent and confess your sins, for God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And David also in Psalm 32 said that, Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. In April of 2002, Lloyd Scott ran the London Marathon wearing a 130-pound antique diving suit. And he crossed the finish line to become the race's slowest participant ever. Scott, at age 40, had a time of 5 days, 8 hours, 29 minutes, and 46 seconds. I should mention that he did this for charity. But I ask you this morning, is there any, something that's slowing you down? Are you trying to run with extra weight? Are you dragging because your calendar is too crazy or you're carrying unconfessed sin in your life? If so, get rid of it. Lighten your load. That's what it means to run freely. Next, run with perseverance. And you know, those who persevere are a rare breed. And I don't necessarily mean win, I just mean persevere. Hang in there. Finish. Stick with it until it's done. But unfortunately, very few of us do that. Our human tendency is to stop before we cross the finish line. And our inability to finish what we start is seen in the smallest of ways, like a partly mowed lawn, half-read book, letters begun but never completed, sermons begun but never completed, an abandoned diet or a car up on blocks. But it also shows up in life's most painful ways, an abandoned child, a cold faith, a job hopper, a wrecked marriage, in unevangelized world? Am I touching some painful areas? Any chance I'm addressing someone who's considering giving up? Well, I want to encourage you to hang in there. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. And as we look at what it means to persevere, I'd like to pause for a second For while I was in seminary, and in regard to the study of Scripture, I was taught that a text taken out of context is a pretext. In other words, context is critical to understanding the meaning of a text. And Hebrews 12.1 begins with these words, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith... And here's another thing I learned in seminary. Now, when you see a therefore... You need to ask yourself, what's the therefore, therefore? Well, it means that our text this morning, Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, is a continuation of what the author addresses in the previous chapter, Hebrews 11, which is often referred to as the faith chapter. Verse 1 defines faith, the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And verse 6 tells us why faith is important, that without faith it's impossible to please God. And, And then the rest of the chapter is story after story of what enduring faith looks like. And today, many people think that our Christian faith is supposed to be a walk in the park. However, if if we were to ask the Hebrew believers of the Old Testament and Jesus followers of the New Testament who are described in chapter 11, I think they would offer a distinctly different portrayal of the life of faith. This great cloud of witnesses endured adversity, hostility, ridicule, imprisonment, poverty, persecution, even execution. And they would say to us, I believe, running can be hard work. The race is long, the journey difficult, the road treacherous. And here's the thing. They are not so much witnesses of our race as they are witnesses to us as to how the race can be run in faith. We look out into this crowd and realize that every one of them finished the race And we're reminded it can be done. It can be done. 
The stands are filled with great spiritual athletes of the past who endured to the end and now encourage us by their example. They are witnesses of God's faithfulness, witnesses of Jesus' power, and witnesses of the faith which only the Holy Spirit can inspire and sustain in us. And interestingly, the Greek word for race is agona. Do you know an English word that sounds like that? Agona? Agony. That's right, agony, meaning a grueling conflict or struggle. Vanderlei de Lima, just a mite of a man. Five foot, five inches, 119 pounds. He's smaller than a lot of fifth and sixth graders. But don't let his size fool you. His body may be small, but his heart is bigger than the Olympic Stadium in Athens, where he ran in the marathon in 2004. He should have won the gold. He was leading the race with only three miles to go when a spectator waylaid him. A deranged protester from Ireland hurled himself into the runner, forcing him off the course and into the crowd. And although stunned and shaken, Delima collected himself and he resumed the race. However, in the process, he lost his rhythm, precious seconds, and he lost his position. Race detractors still prowl the crowds. You don't have to run a literal marathon to go from the front of the pack to flat on your back. Just ask the kids who are gathered at their mother's grave or patients waiting their turn at chemotherapy or the spouse who moved out or the soldier who returns home with a missing limb or the parents of a runaway child or the family made homeless as a result of joblessness or a poor economy. Life devastatingly derailed. How do you get back in the race? I can summarize it with one word. Reduce the solution to a single verb. Condense the explanations into one decision. And what is that word? What is that verb? What is that decision? Trust. Trusting in the oversight of God, even when we don't know why bad things happen or don't know how they'll be resolved. It's knowing who's in charge, and knowing who's in charge counterbalances the mysteries of why and how. Consider Joseph. Hated by his brothers, thrown into a pit, sold into slavery, slavery, falsely accused of attempted rape, only to be thrown into jail, forgotten in prison for two years, appointed to second in command of Egypt, and then eventually he comes face to face with his brothers, who at least indirectly brought all this calamity on him. Hear Joseph's perspectives on all of this. Joseph's brothers became afraid. Now Joseph will pay us back for all the evil we did to him, they said. But Joseph told them, don't be afraid of me. Am I God to judge and punish you? As far as I'm concerned, God turned into good what you meant for evil. He brought me to the high position I have today so I could save the lives of many people. No, don't be afraid. Indeed, I myself will take care of you and your families. That's amazing perspective. Well, as you may have guessed, Vanderlei de Lima did not win the gold medal in the 2004 Olympics. But he didn't give up either. The small-bodied, big-hearted Brazilian entered the old marble stadium with the thrill of a child. He punched his fists in the air, then he ran around zigzagging like an airplane, weaving for joy. Later crowned with an olive wreath and adorned with a bronze medal and an unflappable smile. Delima explained his exhilaration. He said, it's a festive moment, it's a unique moment, it's, most athletes don't, never have this moment. The Olympic spirit prevailed again, I was able to medal for myself and my country. He never complained. Exemplary attitude. And here's the thing, it's not easy to make the best of a derailed life. But God sends enough stories like Joseph's and Vanderlei de Lima's to convince us to give it a try. Brothers and sisters, please don't let the bumps in the race keep you from the awards ceremony at the end. Are you close to quitting? Don't do it. Are you discouraged as a parent? Hang in there. Are you weary with doing good? Do do just a little bit more. 
Are you pessimistic about your job? Well, roll up your sleeves and go at it again. No communication in your marriage? Well, give it another shot. Can't resist temptation? Accept God's forgiveness and go one more round. Remember, a finisher is not one without wounds or weariness. On the contrary, he or she is often battered and bloodied. But hear this. The land of promise, says Jesus, awaits those who endure. It's not just for those who make the victory laps or drink the champagne or cash in the winner's purse. No, the land of promise is for those who simply endure to the end. Galatians 6, 9, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. James 1, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And also in James 1, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. There's a poster that I had up on my college dorm wall, which has words that I think are appropriate here. The race is not always to the swift, but to those who keep on running. And that's what it means to run with perseverance. And then run focused. When running a marathon, I was determined to make the most of the journey, to take in the beauty of the course, to acknowledge the cheering and support of the spectators, to to share in the camaraderie of my fellow runners. However, my main focus was to get to the finish line. That was the highlight of the whole experience. And and the finish line for Grandma's Marathon is near the lift bridge. And, And the interesting thing is while running along the old North Shore Drive, there are several locations on the course where you can look out over Lake Superior and you can see the lift bridge off in the distance. You see the destination. And the further along you get, the closer and bigger the bridge becomes. Throughout the race, I would often remind myself of how great it was going to feel to cross that finish line, to have them place that medallion around my neck, to have them give me that coveted finisher's t-shirt. Now thus far, it might, it might be easy to summarize that what I've said is the command, run the race, and conclude that finishing the race depends on us. But that's not how it works. The writer of Hebrews had something else in mind. He writes, by keeping our eyes focused on Jesus, on whom our faith depends from start to finish. And I'd like to point out the choice of names that the author of Hebrews has made to refer to our Savior here. He tells us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, not on Christ or the Lord or any of his other names or titles. And I believe that this is because the author is calling our attention to our Lord's attitudes and actions when he became flesh and dwelled among us as one of us. And I want to encourage you to ponder in particular Jesus' determination on the cross. Our sermon text informs us that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross and concludes with these words, think of what he went through so that you do not become discouraged or give up. Jesus didn't quit. But don't think for a moment that he wasn't tempted to. Watch him as he grovels in the Garden of Gethsemane. Hear his prayer. Father, if you're willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Did Jesus ever want to quit? I think so. But that's why his words on the cross are so wonderful. It is finished. Stop and listen. Can you imagine that cry from the cross? The sky is dark. The the other two victims are moaning. The jeering voices are silent. Perhaps there's thunder and lightning and pouring rain. Perhaps there's weeping. Perhaps there's silence. Then Jesus draws in a deep breath. He pushes his feet down on the Roman nail and he cries out, It is finished. What was finished? The plan for redeeming humanity was finished. The works done by Christ as a man on earth were finished. 
The sacrifice was made, the sting of death removed, salvation revealed, all done so well. It is finished was not a cry of defeat, but rather a cry of victory, of fulfillment, perhaps even a cry of relief. Jesus endured, and thank God he did. Furthermore, Jesus is not just our example. He is also the giver and sustainer of our faith from start to finish. The God who began a good work in us is going to complete it through Jesus Christ. So don't even begin to think that finishing this race is dependent upon your own strength. The prophet Isaiah instructs us, he, that is God, gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become tired and weak and tired and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. And the apostle Paul adds, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So we see what this looks like in Matthew 14 where the disciples are, are alone in a boat on the Sea of Galilee during a storm. Jesus walks out to meet them in their boat in the middle of the lake and they're terrified. But incredibly, Peter calls out to Jesus and believes. And despite apparent danger, Peter steps out of the boat. Peter walks on water just like Jesus. Can you imagine what faith it required to take that first step? The swirling winds, the churning waves, the clapping thunder. Can you imagine the other disciples' reactions? Peter, what are you doing? Are you crazy? Get back in the boat. But Peter doesn't get back in the boat. Peter walks on water. How? Because he keeps his eyes firmly fixed on Jesus. As soon as he looked away, down he sank. As long as he fixed his eyes on Jesus, he was able to do the impossible. And so we're encouraged, we're commanded, we're implored to fix our eyes upon Jesus, lest we grow weary and lose heart. By faith, keep him always in your sight. Focus on his power, his provision, his grace and glory. Jesus made us lightweight runners when he took the burden of our sins and placed them on himself at the cross. Then he rose from the dead and sat at the right hand of God to pray for us that we might endure to the race's end. But ultimately, in the marathon of faith, Jesus is to be our focus. To be like him, and then ultimately to be with him when we cross the finish line of this life. That is our goal. And every huff, every puff, every twinge of pain, and every prolonged day on earth is worth patiently enduring the journey to get to the finish line and to get to Jesus. Run freely. Run with perseverance. Run focused. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you can do this. And one last thought. Running may appear to be an awfully lonely endeavor. You don't belong to a team per se. It's, it's a solo effort, but nothing can be further from the truth. I've been asked many times what would compel me to run a marathon, let alone 25 of them. Two reasons. The first was the challenge of accomplishing something that seemed beyond my ability. But the second one was really, because I only intended to one run, one, run one marathon, I ended up doing 25, and that was the community. The family, the friends, the other runners, and the literal communities of Duluth and the Twin Cities who experienced the race with me, who encouraged and empowered me by their support. The Olympic Games of 1992 provided one of track and field's most incredible moments. When Great Britain's Derek Redman had dreamed all his life of winning a gold medal in the 400-meter race, and his dream was in sight as the guns sounded in the semifinals at Barcelona, he was running the race of his life. He could see the finish line and rounded the turn into the back stretch, and suddenly he felt a sharp pain go up the back of his leg. He fell face first onto the track with a torn right hamstring. And even though he experienced excruciating pain, he struggled to his feet, pushed away the medical attendants 
who had rushed out to help him, and he started to hop on one leg in a determined effort to finish the race. And when he reached the home stretch, a large man in a t-shirt that said, have you hugged your foot today? And a cap that said, just do it, came out of the stands, hurled aside a security guard and ran to Redmond, embracing him. It was Jim Redmond, Derek's father. You don't have to do this, he told his weeping son. And Derek said, yes, I do. To which Jim replied, well then, we're going to finish this together. And they did. Fighting off security men, the son's head sometimes buried in his father's shoulder, they stayed in Derek's lane all the way to the end as the crowd gaped, then rose and howled and wept. Derek didn't walk away with the gold medal, but he walked away with incredible memory of a father who, when he saw his son in pain, left his seats in the stands to help him finish the race. Have you seen this picture before? picture of a turtle on a fence post? If you see a turtle on a fence post, you know he had some help. And any time I start thinking, wow, look at what I've done, I just need to remember how this turtle, me, got on that post. I've had a lot of help. On Saturday evening, June 9th, 1979, I began my marathon of faith when I surrendered my life to the Lordship of Christ and trusted in Him as the Savior of my life at a lay witness mission in San Antonio, Texas. In the 43 years since, I have many incredible memories of the amazing people who have come alongside me to help me make it this far in my race of faith. Certainly, it begins with the Spirit of God within, my parents, my youth pastor, a number of pastors, Bible college and seminary professors, my wife and children, and many Christian brothers and sisters. They have been models and mentors, educators and encouragers. They have challenged and comforted, loved and listened, supported and shared in the race with me. On June 20th, 2009, my last marathon, when I got to the, spin the starting line, in my bag was a little note from my daughter. Dear Dad, well, after today, you will have 25 marathons under your belt, and I've never been more proud of you. Grandma's marathon has been the marker of the start of my summers forever because I get so excited to watch you. And whether you finish in three hours or finish in six, I'll be just as proud of you. Good luck today, Dad. I know that you'll do good. I'll be praying. Just keep running it out. Love you, Stephanie. Brothers and sisters, if you haven't yet trusted in Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to implore you to enter the race today. If you already trust him, you're running as I speak. And I'd like to encourage you runners to enjoy the journey. It is a great adventure. And finally, I pray that you'll endure to the end, to cross the finish line. And for those of you who do, we'll be able to say with the Apostle Paul, I've fought the good fight, I've finished the race, I've kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for the opportunity to run the race that is marked out for us. Every day, help us to run it with joy and gratitude, faith and endurance. Give us strength, discipline, and focus as we run. For we know, O oh Lord, that it is not a sprint, but rather a marathon. And on this race course called life, there will be times when we run uphill and are truly exhausted, strongly tempted to give up. In those moments, Lord, help us to remember what Jesus did. He obeyed the Father, never gave up, and completed the race marked out for him. 
And as he hung on the cross, he could rightly say, it is finished. So Lord, grant us the stamina and strength like Jesus to be obedient and to finish our race well. Help us to focus on the finish line where you stand with open arms to receive us and place an imperishable crown of righteousness on our heads. That indeed will be a glorious day, making all the pain and hardship encountered during the race worthwhile. And until that day, we will run by faith, not by sight, trusting that you will help us endure to the race's end. And we pray this all in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.